it's, it's nice of those of you who are here to come for this uh, first talk of the last day of this, this marathon. Um, I guess some of the, the f local French speakers might be watching football this morning, but um, hopefully at least they'll have two screens. And <laughs> but in any case, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Carol Ten Carter. Um, he's a world authority on um, the work on animal communication and cognition. And I know his work, I guess, specifically um, through his analyses of um, grammar and syntax in, in, um, in bird song and, and the possible implications for what that might mean for the evolution of communication and things such as language. Um, but he's also worked on a number of non-bird species, including fish and so on, so it's quite a spectrum of of research and, um, and models. Um, he obtained his PhD at the University of Groningen and then worked on sexual preferences in birds, then did two postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Cambridge, then moved back to the Netherlands um, for a brief stint um, at the University of Utrecht and he's now um, a professor and chair at the University of Leiden. And so without further ado, Carol, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so my talk will be on avian cognition, as you see on the screen. Uh, that means it will be about birds, and you may wonder why birds. Well, birds are different. Why are they different, and what do I mean with that? So here you have a phylogenetic tree of a number of vertebrate groups. Um, humans and other mammals, we belong to the placental mammals. And as you see, there is a long time ago, over 300 million years, that we share a common ancestor with birds. So birds are in this branch. Here you have birds, and birds are more closely related to crocodiles than they are to us. Actually, the similarity between a bird and a T-Rex is probably much larger than between us and birds. Um, that is because birds originate from dinosaurs. So birds are different, and at the same time that raises the question, are birds different? And what I mean with that is whether their cognitive abilities also differ a lot from ours and differ a lot from other mammals. <coughs> so in my talk I will address a couple of topics which are related to that. So the question is, are they different, and if so, how? Um, so the topic I will be focusing on today is on what people call higher order cognitive abilities. And what do I mean with that? Well, I focus in particular on a feature which is known as abstraction, uh, and that is whether birds can classify stimuli by their conceptual or relational similarity rather than by their physical similarity. So can they abstract something from examples which is above the actual physical instantiations of these examples. So, for instance, can they detect rules which underlie certain patterns? Are they capable of analogical reasoning? And the third topic I will address is can they detect rhythms? So these are all examples of abilities to detect something which is beyond the physical properties of the examples underlying it. So first, can birds detect abstract rules? Now, the type of rules I'm interested in, that was alluded to a bit in the introduction by, by Lars, is that I also work on comparison of language and bird songs and bird abilities, linguistic abilities of birds. So my example is also derived from that. So when you have language, language is structured, and it's structured in a particular way. So each language has a limited number of speech sounds, phonemes, and these sounds are arranged in particular order in order to create words, and there are particular rules which, um, which make some words legal and others illegal in particular languages. Now these words in, terms are, in turn are arranged in meaningful sentences, meaningful patterns, by grammatical rules. So for instance, a sentence like John loves Mary, when you read that and you hear that, you know that the meaning of that sentence is different from Mary loves John, 
even though the words are the same, it's the sequence of words which make the difference. So in this case, John is the subject um, or the object uh, and Mary is the subject of his affection. And here it's the other way around. And that is because English, like several other languages, it's a subject verb object language, an SVO language, which means that even if you have a sentence with words you've never ever encountered before, like the snark bricks the bojum, you know that there is something, something like a snark which does something to something else, which is a bojum. So we understand these sentences because uh, we are, over our lives, we have discovered that English is an SVO language. And these grammatical rules, they are acquired by experience. They are not explicitly trained, but we acquire them from the language we hear around us. So why are birds an interesting comparison uh, to search for abilities which might be somewhat similar to what's underlying language? Well, already Darwin noticed that the sounds of uttered by birds offer in several respects the nearest analogy to language. Now, that statement was made long ago, but it may still hold. And why is that? Because bird songs, as no doubt you know, they are complexly structured vocalizations, uh, a rapid series of sounds which is produced in a particular order. And because it's such a rapid, string of sounds that also required that on the receiving end as well as on the production side there must be very rapid processing of these structures going on. Also in many bird species, in particular songbirds like the zebra finch, the starling or crow, uh, their vocalizations are learned. They are also learned in some other groups like parrots. And this vocal learning is also something which these bird groups share with our human language. And uh, all these species have a very specialized neural circuitry, which is particularly devoted to both the production and the perception of songs. So there are similarities there which are greater between birds and then uh, between birds and humans than between several mammal species and humans. So that's why birds are interesting. And the question is, can birds, if they have this complex vocalizations, can say also detect sort of grammatical rules. Now, how do we examine that? Well, we make use of a paradigm which is called artificial grammar learning. Now, artificial grammars are strings of meaningless speech sounds which are arranged according to a specific rule, the grammar. Um, and the experiments usually examine the learning of these grammar by exposing human infants or adults to a series of examples of strings which are arranged, all arranged according to that particular underlying rule. And then after a couple of exposures, then the individuals can be tested on novel exemplars of these strings, organized either in the same way or in a different way. And then uh, you can ask adults or you can use a looking paradigm with infants to see whether they notice there is a change in the underlying pattern. Now that sort of method is also usable for suitable for <coughs> testing animals. So the question I'm going to address now is whether birds can detect patterns that are also detected by human infants and adults. Now these experiments um, I will tell you about, they are inspired by work on infants on an infant study by Gary Marcus and others uh, quite a few years ago, but uh, still very up to date in when you look at how often it's being used as a paradigm and as a study uh, giving rise to novel experiments. So the experiment goes like this. It has been done with infants in the range of six to nine months of age. They are exposed to a st speech stream of syllables and like ga ga ti, pause, li li na, then we'll, and another pause, then more of these triplets followed. So that string is repeated a series of times. And if you do that, play that to a young infant, at first it will look up, 
because the sound is being played. After a while, it habituates, it ignores what's going on. And then at that stage, the, the experimental phase or the test phase really starts. So first, what you might have noticed is that there is a pattern here, and that pattern is X, X, Y. So all these triplets have the same structure, X, X, Y, X, X, Y. And the question is whether the inference from exposure, they learn to detect that this is the underlying structure and that that is a different structure than X, Y, X. So what you do is then you play novel sound, novel syllables, and the infant has never heard those particular syllables, like momo fi. They were not part of the training string. So what does the infant do? Well, nothing. She is habituated, and this is not enough to arise her interest in the string. So it's being treated as the other sounds. But now you play mo fi mo, same sounds, but now in a different order, x, y, x. And then the infant looks up. So apparently from experiencing this string in which all triplets are organized according to the same grammar, the infant has picked up the underlying structure and it notices that there is something different there. Now this experiment has uh, inspired quite a few people to see whether animals are also able to detect these patterns. So there have been done experiments with rats, for instance, and with rhesus macaques and a few bird species. Uh, also using similar paradigms or slightly different paradigms. Actually, well, when you look at these studies, as we did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, although there are claims that these animals indeed could detect these underlying rules, there are a number of problems with all of these studies. And one of the main ones is that many of the test strings could actually be identified by the animals based on phonetic similarities. So the same type, sound types were used in the test strings as in the training strings. So they could use just the sound uh, similarity to judge whether a string was correct or not, rather than the abstract pattern. And what we are interested in is the, is the learning of the underlying abstract pattern. So that inspired us to start some work on zebra finches and butchery cars, asking essentially the same question again. Can birds or can animals detect strings by having been exposed to uh, a couple of examples? So in our experiments, we make use of what's called a go-no-go -go training, and it has already been uh, in the talk by Debbie Kelly. So our paradigm is, is quite similar to that. Now, what is a go-no-go -go, uh, training? Here you see a zebra finch in a, in a cage, and there are two buttons here. This one has a light on it, and if a bird pecks that key, then a sound is being played. And that sound can either be a go sound or a no-go sound. A go sound means that it then has to peck on this key, and then the foot hatch opens. So this is what happens. Okay, so this is a bird which has been trained. It knows how to handle the situation. Uh, it pecks on the second key. Then it gets exposure to food so it can eat a bit. And then in order to get more food, it has again to peck that key. Now, if it's a no-go uh, sound that it hears and it pecks that key, then the light goes off for a couple of seconds as a signal that uh, it did something which it should not be doing. Okay. So what were the go and the no-go sounds? So we used uh, triplets, like those speech triplets used in the infants, but in our case, we didn't use speech triplets, but we did cut the elements out of the songs of zebra finches, and they have songs containing a variety of different elements, which are easily identified, so you can pick them out and uh, then we can make these X, X, Y, X structures by using different types of elements. So each letter here identifies a particular element type. So this might have been an A, and this might have been a D element. So as you see, there are five triplets which have an X, Y, X structure. 
consisting of different combinations of elements, and there are five triplets which have an XXY structure. So the first question is actually, can the birds be trained to discriminate these two sequences from each other? Well, it's no problem at all for them. They can easily do that. The question is, what have they actually learned? They might have learned that there are 10 different sounds. And for each sound, they might have learned, OK, if I hear DFD, then I should go to get my food. And if I hear DDF, I should not go. So they might have, for each individual sound, they might have memorized and know what the appropriate response would be to get food or to avoid this uh, light off. Um, so they need not have detected any underlying regularity there. Now the way to test that is to give them test triplets. So after they've been trained, they were given test triplets which were not reinforced, and we gave them three different types of test triplets. So some of them, the green ones, you also see in the training triplets. So they are the same, but they don't get any reinforcement. So they are the control. They should definitely be able to discriminate between these two. Now these ones are made up of elements which are completely novel and share no physical similarity to any of the training stimuli. Uh, and then there are triplets which are new combinations of familiar training items. So all these elements in these triplets are present there, but not in the same combination. So how did the birds respond to it? So the hypothesis is if they really learned the underlying rule, they should treat these ones in the same way as these ones. And also, of course, these ones. So what happened? So this is how they uh, treated the test triplets, which were also in the training stream. So we gave them 40 exemplars of the various test triplets. And here you see the number of go responses. And the dark column indicates the go responses to the sounds of the structure on which they were trained to go. And this is re go responses to the sound of the structure they should not go. So you can see that there's a very clear difference. They make a couple of mistakes, but not uh, that many, and they always, almost always go if it's a sound which is really providing them food. Now, how do they treat these completely novel sounds? Well, that's what you see up down here. And what you see is that in this case, well, they hardly respond at all. So they tend to ignore these novel sounds altogether. And there is also no difference between the two, no significant difference. So apparently, the zebra finches have not picked up the underlying structure from this experiment. What happened to the novel combinations of familiar sound? Now here the story becomes a bit more interesting. And that's immediately clear if you see this picture. So you see that there are some combinations, BDB uh, versus BBD, that they do show the same difference as they show to the training sound. So apparently, although these combinations were never encountered before, they still treat them in the same way as combinations they have heard before. But look at what's going on here at the end. In this case, FEF -E and FFE, -E, the birds actually back more to the sounds they should ignore <coughs> based on their structure than they pack on the sounds they should prefer based on their structure, which are these ones. So a significant difference completely the other way around than over there. Now what's going on here? So let's have a closer look at this, what these uh, stimuli actually were. So BDB and BBD. Now let's compare that with the training triplets. You see that there is a training triplet which starts with a B and which ends like a B, just like BDB. There is also one which has a D in the middle. And similarly, if you look at these strings, the X, X, Y strings, there is one starting with BB and one ending with D. So there is a clear similarity in the structure of these test sounds and some of the training sounds. So they might have generalized based on that. Now, what is the situation for these last uh, triplets, F, E, F? 
Now let's look at the similarity of FEF with these training triplets. There is none of these training triplets which starts with an F or ends with an F or has an E in the middle, none of them. You do find training triplets with an F at the end and an E in the middle, but they are part of this string the XXY structure rather than the XYX structure. Similarly, if you look at the FFE triplets, there are sounds which have an F in the middle here or an E at the end, but they are part of these strings, the XYX strings, rather than the XXY strings. So actually, this training triplet has more sound similarity to training triplets of this string than it has to training triplets of that string. So what the zebra finches seem to focus on are local features. Apparently they have stored all these different sounds in mind and compare each test sound with the training sound and then look what the similarity is. And then they go for the sound with the largest similarity based on the local features, where exactly is which element. Okay, so these were the zebra finches, no evidence of rule learning. How about the budgies? Well, these were the results of the budgies, and you see there is a very striking difference. No matter what the structure of the nature of these test sounds is, if it's new combinations, in all cases, they make the distinction based on the underlying structure rather than on the physical similarity. If they would have done it on the physical similarity, they would show the same pattern. The only way to explain this is that they really learned the underlying structure. Well, at the same time, you will have noticed, well, what's going on here? If they would have noticed the underlying structure, they should also have identified these novel, completely novel sounds in the correct way. They didn't do that. Now, that bothered us. They learned the rule, apparently, but they didn't apply it to these novel stimuli. You see that there are very few responses, actually one or two at most out of the 40. But at the same time, if they responded once or twice in the few animals which did, it seemed to indicate that, yeah, they did know the difference, but didn't really use it. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that all these test sounds were given in between training sounds. So if they wanted to get food, they could completely ignore any test sound and just respond to the training sounds. That's actually the most profitable way to go around. And what the Birches might have noticed is that this is a novel sound. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get any food reinforcement no matter what I do. So I just ignore it. I don't respond when I hear those sounds. Now, if something like that was going on, then what we would expect is that if they had no other option, they would really uh, discriminate. So we uh, did another experiment. After these birds uh, had this first test, we uh, trained them again, uh, up to uh, including some of these novel test sounds. So this is uh, the, test, the training sounds they got. They got up to stable performance again. And then from one day to the next one, we switched the full training set. So they all got novel sounds. None of the earlier sounds were present again. So if they wanted to get food, they should uh, use the, and find out which of the new training sounds are giving a reinforcement. Now, we used four different novel elements to make novel stimuli forming this set. So we had 12, element, 12 combinations of these novel elements, x, y, x, and 12 combinations, x, x, y. We looked at the very first time for each of these triplets how they responded to that particular triplet. So we took the first 24, 2 times 12, uh, uh, appearances of these, each of, of these novel stimuli. And then we looked how did they treat them. Now, and this is the picture we got. We had six animals. This is the level, the level of discrimination 
at the end of training, which is around 75-80%, which is the level at uh, which we stop the training and start the test. This is how they treated the first time for all these different stimuli. And what you see is that out of the six animals, four remained at the same level from one day to the next. So immediately they noticed, okay, if I want to get food, I should respond to those elements which have the same structure as the ones which gave that uh, food before. Um, there's one animal going down to chance, but uh, after a couple of more exposures, it immediately also went up f much faster than it would have done if it would have to start from scratch. So do these patches show rule learning? Well, our conclusion is yes. This is an example of rule learning by a bird, grammatical rule learning. So can birds detect abstract rules? Well, zebra finches, they have a problem. They are very good at detecting physical similarities, not so good at uh, the underlying pattern, whereas the budgies detect a rule. Next question is, are birds capable of analogical reasoning? Now, the reason for inserting this element in my presentation, it's about experiments not done by us, but by other people, is that there is actually a similarity between what uh, I've just shown you and this uh, analogical reasoning paradigm. Now, let me first go to explain you what analogical reasoning is about. So, um, those who, of you who were present at Debbie Kelly's talk, will remember that she actually presented something about the same different paradigm, in which you first expose an animal to an example, and then uh, it has, it's being presented with the same a picture, which is the same as the picture it has seen before, and a different picture. And the animal has to learn that each time it has to pick the picture, which is identical to the example it has been shown before. And after some training, they also identify or can do that test with novel pictures they have not seen before. Now, that's a sort of a match to sample task. Now, this is a similar uh, setup. So this is the sample which is shown to an animal. And then it has the choice between this set and that set. Now, it should choose this one and not that one. Uh, and if you replace this by squares, then it should go for the squares and not for the triangles. So you can train an animal to do this task. So this is a match to sample. Now what's a relational match to sample? That's what you see over here. It's again trained on examples, but then it's given a test between two squares and two differently looking objects. And if it's, uh, if it's showing <coughs> relational learning, then it should realize that this, the relation between these two objects is the same as the relation between these two objects. Here they are the same, there they are the same, these ones are different. If they are shown these patterns, for instance, then they should realize, okay, these are two different ones and those are two different ones. So they should base their judgment on the relation between the training sets to identify the correct uh, test. Uh, item. Now, these experiments have been done by some Russian uh, researchers, uh, Smirnova or Bozova, with hooded crows and orange-winged Amazons. And for both species, the outcome is very similar. So, how did they go about? So, the first step is that they were trained on a simple match-to-sample task in which they were shown one object and then they had to, to identify the same object uh, from a set of two more. And those objects were differing in uh, color, for instance, or they were different in shape. Now, after they mastered that, which wasn't too difficult for them to master, then they were given uh, this uh, set of stimuli in which the objects are not of, uh, don't differ in color, they don't differ in shape, as they did in the earlier training, but now they differ in size. They have never been exposed to a task in which you had to identify uh, 
or provide a correct answer by attending to signs. So it's a novel task for them. Uh, so this is the example they are shown, and then this is the correct answer here, the sample, this is the correct answer, in this case, this is the correct answer. Um, so this is novel to them, this situation. Nevertheless, they do quite well. So they transferred from similarity to color uh, and similarity in shape to similarity in size. So that's an example of going beyond the actual training items already. But now you see these, this bar and also for this bar, you see that they are given a sample which is different in shape from these other ones. And what they do is then they pick this one because it's the large object. So somehow they figure out that if it's a large object which is given as sample, then I go for a large one irrespective of its size. Okay, so, and they made no difference between these sort of trials and those sort of trials. So they readily generalize according to the underlying principle. So they continued that training and then they got to the stage at which, uh, which is similar to what I showed you in my example introducing the whole system. So in this test, and actually it's quite complicated even for us the first time you look at it. So what should they be doing here, you may wonder. Okay, let's look at the first example. What they are trained on here is similarity in shape. So there are two circles here, and this is the one which is corresponding most with that one rather than that one. So they ignore color, they should ignore color, and only attempt to shape, and that's what they do. Here you see uh, a circle and a square, and again, this is the one which matches in shape, and this is the one which is deviant, so they should go for that one, that's what they do. Here, again, two different shapes, they should go for this one, not for that one, and that's what they do. But now have a look at this. Here, the shapes are different, colors are different, um, and you don't find any of these shapes in the test ones, but what you do see here is two objects which are different in shape, and these objects are the same in shape. So if they have this relational rule, they should treat this one as the correct one and not that one. And that's what they actually do without being explicitly trained on it. So it's very remarkable. And just to show you how that's done, there's a <coughs> video here. So this is an example in which the colors are the same, but you see the symbols are different. And you see that this is this example given to the animal. And if it wants to get food, it has to remove that panel and then it can get food. Now, this is, uh, this is an example which is closer to this set. So two pluses, and indeed it goes for the one which has the two identical objects, even though the colors of these objects are different. So a remarkable ability in crows and in Amazons to detect this relational similarity. Now, coming back to this Bertschi example I showed you, that's actually quite comparable with this one. It's also analogical reasoning. If it is X, X, Y, so two acoustic items which are similar to each other followed by a different one, they have to detect that the relation between the X's and the Y's is different between X, X, Y and X, Y, X. So it's in the same range as this sort of pattern shown, but here in the visual domain. Okay, coming to my last uh, part of my talk, and this is also, I should give you a warning, this is becoming more messy as it's going <coughs> along. But anyway, I'll tell you about it. And that's the question whether birds can detect rhythms. Now, again, a quote by Darwin, our famous uh, uh, biologist, at least for me as a biologist, uh, one of our heroes. And one of the things he's, he said in one of his books is that the perception, if not the enjoyment of musical cadences and of rhythm, is probably common to all animals and no doubt depends on the common physiological nature of their nervous system. So for Darwin, it was not a question at all that birds or any animals had 
the ability to appreciate music and patterns in music. And that required that they actually should be able to detect the underlying structure. So our enjoyment in music is not because we hear individual sounds, but because we are sensitive to the overall pattern which is generated by a musical performance. Now the question is, uh, is whether birds can detect pattern regularity. Uh, which Darwin would expect they did, but um, the question is whether they really do. Now, you may be familiar with these two individuals. Uh, so this is Snowball, a cacatoo, and this is Alex, the famous gray parrot, known from the work of Irene Pepperberg. And actually, for both of these parrots, there are nice video clips which uh, indicate <laughs> that they actually can dance to the music. Now, what does that look like? Uh, it looks like this. I warn you about the sound. Now, look here. That's this is the number of beats per minute. So now the sound is being speeded up. And here it's even faster. So he's really dancing, isn't he? When you looked carefully, you could see that uh, although it made his rhythmic move, uh, movements, um, it also made his rhythmic movements synchronize with the music, but only to a certain degree. So it's certainly not perfect what this bird showed. And that has been analyzed in great detail. So there are bouts in which it's synchronized, but there are also it's a considerable long bout in which is not synchronized with the music, but it does show some rhythmic behavior. Now, the interesting question is, does it in indeed indicate that this bird is sensitive to this rhythm or that birds in general are sensitive to rhythms? Um, Snowball adjusted its tempo of movement. That was very clear. When the sound is being speeded up, it uh, apparently detects the beat and the beat goes faster, and then it goes along with the beat and also moves faster. So it shows what's called beat perception and synchronization. Now that phenomenon uh, uh, is something which is very, has been considered very important uh, uh, in respect to what's underlying this phenomenon. So Ani Patel, uh, someone who was interested in the evolution of musical abilities, he um, proposed the hypothesis that actually you will only find this sort of rhythmic entrainment in species which show vocal learning. Now, why did he say that? If you are a vocal learning species, then you have, then you, uh, have to learn to recognize vocal patterns, but you have to link that to your motor output in order to produce these patterns. So there must be a tight connection between perception and motor control. Now that's something which isn't found in the brains of all animals, only in those limited set of, of animals, among which the vocal learners. So the idea is that you will find this sort of behavior in vocal learning species, but not in non-vocal learning, or vocal non-learning species, I should say. And uh, in order to examine that question, uh, the relatedness between vocal learning and rhythmic uh, entrainment, um, a couple of people did a large survey, and uh, well, I mean, you can't identify all these lines here, but these are all different species, and these are all other species, 
And uh, some of them are vocal non-mimics and others are vocal mimics. And this is the result of a very extensive YouTube survey in which they searched for movies showing dancing animals. And then they were analyzing whether these animals actually showed the synchronization with the music, and with the beat in the music or not. Now, of course, there are problems there that maybe the sound is put in after the animal did the movement, so you have to be very careful, but they applied quite strict criteria. What you also see is that there are some dark blocks here, but no dark blocks here, and the dark blocks indicate those movies in which they identified serious signs of entrainment to the rhythm of the movie. And what you see is that indeed it does occur in vocal mimics, but none of the vocal non-mimics shows anything like that. But then when you look at more detail in which species are actually part of that select group, there is an elephant there, which is quite extraordinary, but I won't talk about the elephant anymore. But if you look at the other bird species, they are actually all parrot species. Now that's remarkable. Uh, entrainment is present indeed in vocal mimics, but it seems only present or only have been shown so far in parrots. So maybe there is something special about parrots. Why is there no songbird in this range? There are songbirds here, and actually there are a few songbirds in this list which should have ended up here. So the situation is even more dramatical that songbirds have been examined, but didn't show any sign of rhythmic entrainment. So is there rhythm perception in songbirds? That's the question we were posing ourselves, because songbirds are vocal learners. Um, well, there might be. Um, so if you think back of the example of Snowball, this is a, a zebra finch, and zebra finch have songs that sound like this. So they have a motif, as it's called, and which is repeated uh, time and time again. And uh, these researchers did an interesting experiment in which they trained zebra finches to discriminate between two different songs. And then they uh, modified these songs by compressing them or expanding them. And that's what you see over here. And then they asked whether the zebra finches were still capable of discriminating the songs, identifying the correct songs after these tempo changes. And the result is what you see over here. So if they would fail to discriminate the songs with different uh, tempo changes, then they would be at chance level. And what you see is that songs with a 60% duration, highly compressed, they are still identified more or less correctly. Not perfect anymore, but still considerably above chance. If you expand it along uh, extensively, then they also still identify it significantly above chance. Which is suggesting that, yes, zebra finches may be like snowball, maybe they can detect a pattern there and maintain that recognition if it's speeded up or slowed down. So we were uh, then interested in examining this phenomenon in more detail. And we did so by uh, a series of experiments of rhythm perception in which we really went down uh, to strip the sound from everything apart from rhythm. So we trained again zebra finches in this go-no-go -no -go setup, and we had a stimulus which consisted of uh, a series of peeps. That was a regular pattern, as you may have noticed. And uh, as the other stimulus, the no-go stimulus in this case, were four different types of irregular patterns. And uh, so the birds could be trained to discriminate these two. And then we asked the question, what will they do if we compress or expand these, uh, these series? Now the result is what you, or well, the, this is an example of the, the different test stimuli. So this is the original training stimuli, a no-go stimulus. This is the same no-go stimulus, but then being compressed or expanded. 
so tempo manipulations. From those earlier experiments, we actually uh, expected that the birds would be very quickly at recognizing this, identif this uh, speeded up or slowed down patterns. So what are the results of our experiments? So this is how they responded to the training sound. This is the training sound of the ice, isochronous, so the regular pattern. This is the irregular pattern. Now what happened if we speed it up or slow down the sound? Now what you see is that the irregular ones, when we modified them, they didn't really differentiate there. But the interesting thing is these ones. So what you see is actually that they ceased responding to these regular sounds if the, pet if the speed was uh, faster or slower than in the training sounds. So apparently they did not generalize according to the underlying pattern. They failed to recognize these sounds as being the ones which were familiar to them. Uh, so we thought, okay, maybe we should give it uh, different options. Uh, so we gave it a, a training set in which we already included speeded up and slowed down versions of our first stimulus. So we uh, gave it a positive sound or positive sounds were also sounds which were 80% or 120% uh, duration of the original training sound. And what you see here is then we, when we then gave them test sounds, they showed essentially the same pattern. So if we slow down or speed it up, then again, they really fell down really remarkable in their performance. So apparently, even though they had been trained, okay, pay attention to the speed of delivery, or, or rather ignore the speed of delivery, but pay attention to the underlying structure, no, they didn't do that. Right, so again, the zebra finches seemed highly sensitive to the individual specific characteristics of the training stimuli, specific intervals, but not to the underlying pattern. So that gave rise to the question, is there something similar, special uh, to parrots? Because the parrots showed thing, things like that and the zebbies did not. So are parrots special? So we decided to do another experiment, uh, testing a songbird versus a parrot in the same conditions. In this case, we made the sound a bit more complicated. So one of the reasons why that first experiment might have failed is maybe it's too simple a sound, just these simple ticks. And maybe we should make it more, uh, a bit more complex and adding beats to the sound. So we had two types of elements, loud ones, the X ones, and softer ones, the Y ones. And the string sounded like this. So you can hear a louder, uh, higher uh, click than, and uh, a series of softer ones. And we trained them to discriminate this pattern from that pattern and both species could do that. And then after they uh, had learned this, we did uh, first the same thing as we did with these earlier stimuli, a tempo change. So these are the training sounds, regular beats, and irregular beats. This was the go sound, this is the no-go sound. So we slowed it down or speeded it up, and then we looked at how the birds were performing. Now this is how the zebra finches performed. If we slowed it down, you see that they made no difference between the regular beats and the irregular beat pattern. So that's what these two columns indicate. Uh, if the sound was faster, then we see that there is still a difference there, but at the same time, the responses did go down. So yes, there might be something there, but again, only in one direction and not very convincingly. And what did the bird sheets do? Well, we had only three bird sheets. So here I plot the individual data for the three bird sheets. And what you see is essentially they behave in the same way as the zebra finches. Uh, they didn't detect the differences, uh, or they didn't detect that actually the speeded and the slow down sounds were the same as the training uh, patterns. 
So conclusion, no or at best a weak overall rhythm detection present in these uh, stimuli. Um, then we decided to do another test. So they, m they discriminated the training stimuli. And the question then is, what did they use to discriminate the training stimuli? They didn't attend to the overall pattern, which is the regularity of the beats. Nevertheless, they could have used where the beats in the sound are to discriminate between the two training sounds. So here we ask the question, did they attend to these beats and the intervals between them to discriminate the training strings as they did? So what we did is we took out or added extra, an extra Y element. So here it's four Y elements rather than three. We also took one out or we removed them completely, but the beat pattern remains there. So how did they respond to uh, that? Training differentiated, one element added, an element removed, or uh, no elements, Y elements present at all. Well, what you see is that they, uh, again, failed to discriminate these patterns. There is a weak trend that they still differentiate here, but uh, when you remove all Y elements, they don't recognize the sound anymore. And the same for the budgies. Here you see again the budgie ex uh, results plotted in here. Again, they don't seem to be uh, in the same line. So the conclusion, discrimination is not be based on beat detection, discrimination between these two strings. So it becomes puzzling. Um, we did a third experiment, a third test. And in this case, we also created a tempo change. And the tempo change is in terms of the total duration. It's the same as in the first experiment I showed you. But in the first experiment, the elements and the pauses were compressed or stretched uh, to create the tempo change. Here we took the elements and the beat elements and the intermediate elements, and they are all the same, but we created a tempo change by adding a Y element or removing a Y element. So this is longer, uh, has more elements, and this has fewer elements than those ones, but the elements are of the same nature. So how did they respond? In this case, we did find a difference here that both species discriminated based on the underlying structure. So this is the, how they, uh, if the, the whole string became longer by the addition of elements, then they maintain the discrimination between the regular and the irregular beat pattern. And the same here, they maintained the discrimination between regular and irregular. Okay. So, and that is suggesting something that, yes, there is some feeling of rhythmicity and pattern detection, but it's only maintained and they only seem to be able to do that if the local cues in the sounds are familiar. If the elements are the same, the pauses are the same, then they recognize it. If you fiddle around with that, then they fail to recognize. So it seems that they are only sensitive to the global rhythmic pattern if the local features remain constant. And the global pattern is the beat regularity or irregularity. And the local features are things like duration of elements and pauses and the presence of both element types. So the answer to whether birds are capable or these species are capable of rhythm perception is actually not very clear. That's why I said this becomes a bit messy, this part of the talk. We don't really know what's going on, what sort of perception or appreciation these birds have from rhythmic patterns. They are not attending to the same features we are attending to, but what exactly they are attending to, we don't really know yet. So we're doing some follow-up experiments. Now, how does this fit into the picture, the larger picture of what's known about the rhythm perception in birds? Now, um, I've shown you the large parrots. I've shown you these spe two species. And uh, there are two types of experiments. So uh, what we did with the, with the zebra finches to start with that is that first we had these monotonous strings. One sound, 
which was regular or irregular by the pauses between them. And then we did, uh, and we looked at whether the birds were capable of discriminating that. Then we did this tempo transfer. Um, the other experiment is more in this domain, a beat pattern. So the elements were all of the same, uh, the pauses in between the elements were the same, irrespective of what the beat pattern was. But the beat pattern was regular or irregular, and we did a temp tempo transfer. Now the beat pattern is something to which the large parrot responded. And this is actually what is shown in the movie I showed you. They were sensitive to the beat patterns and they maintained uh, their rhythmicity when there was a tempo transfer. Uh, we, won't n we don't know how these parrots would perform in a test like we did with the zebra finches, but given that they do this, we assume they do that. Well, we don't know, but it's, that's why it's a question mark. Now, the zebra finches in our first experiment, they could discriminate these monotonous strings, but they failed in the tempo transfer. We didn't do that with the budgies, so we can't tell what they would do. They only showed weak indications of maintaining the discrimination between regular and irregular beat patterns with the tempo transfer. Um, now, there have been a few studies in the past on similar paradigms with starlings and with jackdaws. Now, starlings, they have also been tested in experiments somewhat similar like this and similar like that. And in both cases, yes, the starlings, the training strings were discriminated quite well. And actually, the starlings also showed some generalization when there was a tempo transfer. They did better than our species did in a very comparable test. And then we have jackdaws. Jackdaws had not been tested in this situation, but there is an experiment in this situation in which they are quite capable of identifying regularity in the stimulus, which had a tempo transfer. So the jackdaws actually seem to be doing quite well. And then there have been some interesting experiments on a non-songbird, a non-vocal, non-learning species, the pigeon. The pigeons, uh, they are also very poor, if at all capable, of doing a tempo transfer with different beat patterns. Interestingly enough, the pigeons could not be trained to discriminate a regular from an irregular string in which all the elements were the same. So very clear, I mean, they've tried very hard, but the uh, pigeons simply failed to do that. Now, where does that lead us if we look at the picture of birds overall? So, is vocal learning playing a role here? Is it the case that rhythm perception is only present in vocal learning species? Well, this is where the border is between vocal learners and non-learners. Well, there might be some difference between this group and that group, but on the other hand, I mean, it's a gradual difference rather than anything else, it seems. Um, are parrots special? Well, birchies are parrots, but they are no different from zebra finches in this task, so parrots apparently also are not very special. So what seems to be happening is that there is a sort of a graded scale in which uh, some species seem to be focusing in particular on very local features of a rhythmic stimulus, not recognizing rhythmicity, whereas some other species seem capable of really attending to more global features of rhythmicity. And the number of species are somewhere in that continuum. What that means in terms of underlying mechanisms, we don't know yet. But that seems to be the case, at least in a descriptive sense, there is a graded scale of being sensitive to rhythms. Now, with that, I come to the end of my talk. So, talking about bird cognition, are birds ca capable of classifying stimuli by conceptual or relational rather than physical similarity? Um, yes, some species are able to detect a rule. Crows and Amazons are able to detect relational similarity, as birches seem to be in the acoustic domain. If you're talking about rhythms, yes, some species seem capable of that. Other species are incapable of that and they might vary in degree rather than in kind here. 
So what are the conclusions overall? Do birds have higher order cognitive abilities? Well, first of all, I hope it's also clear that birds are not a uniform category. What one species does, a zebra finch, is not the same as what another species can do, uh, like a budgie. Some species are indeed capable of relational or abstract, uh, relational reasoning or abstraction. But there is a graded scale from local to global ones. Interestingly, in our experiments, we also find individual differences which seem to indicate that there might be different mechanisms used by different individuals. Um, another thing is that the budgies and the zebra finches differed very clearly in that first experiment on the grammar structure, but they are similar in the rhythm experiment. So that seems to be that if they have an ability to do that in one particular modality or task, it need not predict how they will perform in another task. So there might be a strong modularity in uh, their cognitive abilities. And sort of overall, well, we pay attention to, we are inclined to always pay attention to sort of conceptual similarities, whereas the birds seem to be more guided by perceptual processes. At the same time, as my last examples gave it, we, we are still trying to figure out what's going on there, the how and why of the variation we show. And in a way, we have only started to begin to address these questions. With that, I'd like to thank you and also my collaborators on the studies I showed you, in particular Michelle Spearings, former PhD student uh, and now postdoc in Tecumseh Fitch's lab in uh, Vienna. And uh, should you like to know more about avian cognitive abilities, then there is this nice book and Debbie will recognize that because she also has a very nice chapter on her work in that book. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Before we open up the general discussion, we have a discussant, Fernanda Juarez, um, who will speak for about five minutes, yes, and then we'll open up the, the discussion for both of you folks. Thank you. Thank Um, so while my uh, presentation is opened, I just wanted to thank uh, Carol for a wonderful talk. Uh, for those that were here yesterday, I'm uh, finish currently finishing my PhD in uh, neuroscience and I work on the neural correlates of categorization and categorical perception. And uh, after this talk and after reading uh, Carol's papers, I was uh, amazed by the amount of um, analogies that can be drawn from uh, bird cognition and bird work to categorization and category learning in humans. So in five minutes, which is a very few time, I'll try to uh, speak a little bit about the work we do in the lab on category learning and how we, uh, we also, uh, always treat category learning as related to uh, the language and speech abilities in humans. So I'm going to try to extrapolate a little bit of what Carl has spoken about uh, to what happens in humans and how could this be related to uh, speech production. So as, uh, based on the fact that, as we have seen, birds have cognitive, some cognitive traits that underlie human speech production. So I'm gonna to try to summarize very quickly a little bit about that. Okay, so to begin with, I wanted to make a quick distinction between discrimination and categorization. So uh, discrimination is a relative judgment. You see or hear two stimuli and you have to respond to the second compared to the first, seeing if it's saying if it's identical or not identical. So in what Carl spoke about, match to sample tasks, same different judgment tasks as Debbie Kelly also uh, talked about, and ABX judgments are type uh, relative judgments, discrimination judgments. So two sounds, are these the same or are these different? The, peck, the bird will peck differently if they're the same or if they're different. Uh, compared to categorization, which is an absolute judgment. In what we do in the lab, we show uh, 
subject a stimulus and he has to assign it to one of two arbitrary categories. So is, this is either category A or category B and this is absolute. Uh, so in the, uh, the go, no go task would be a categorical judgment if I'm not mistaken. The bird hears a sequence of sounds and he has to click on the go or on the no go depending on if this of the categorical, uh, so it's a categorical judgment, absolute. It's not related to a previous stimuli. Previous stimuli can affect your judgment but your judgment is just based on one stimulus. And uh, this is all related to the fact that categorization is doing the right thing with the right kind of thing. So grouping things in functional groups that we can act towards in a similar way. And this leads us to a consequence of categorization, which is categorical perception, which is a change in the way we perceive stimuli, regardless of similarity, like in what Carol was talking about. So we ignore the real physical difference. We don't ignore, but we change the real physical differences when stimuli cross the boundary. We will see two stimuli as more similar when they pertain to the same category and as more different when they pertain to different categories, compression and separation. So this is an example in colors in the blue-green spectrum, but this is an example of innate categories, at least in, in humans. We have already receptors in our retinas that compress and separate for us, regardless of learning or not learning the categories. So now we go to category learning. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> this comes from another presentation. But all of this was to say what we do in the lab is that we bring subjects to the lab and we train them uh, to categorize stimuli. We have done it with visual stimuli and with auditory stimuli. And they do three tasks. These two discrimination tasks, which as I said, are relative judgments. They start, they see two stimuli. Are these the same or are they different? We control, well, we measure their performance. Then they have a categorization training. They see the stimulus. This is either A or B. We call them calamites or lacamites, clicking on the keyboard. But the task can change. Uh, here they have to click on a button. They have feedback. Eventually they learn the category and then they do discrimination judgments again. Um, then how are our categories formed? Maybe you can find some analogy to what Carol uh, pre presented. We do it uh, with visual, and this is an example of visual and auditory categories, and they're formed of many features. So in order to categorize, our subjects have, learned to, have to learn to attend the features that are relevant for the category and ignore those that are not relevant for the category. In the case of, I don't know if we have that, oh no. All right. Do I have a pointer? Well, in the case of uh, the visual categories, they're made of like small building blocks with pixels. Center? Okay. So there are some that are present, that are important, that will always be present for the category K, some that will always be present for category L, and some other small, um, fe what we call features that can be in both. So in order to learn to categorize, we have to learn to extract these features that are relevant for category membership and ignore the rest. And uh, another student in the lab, uh, Lucas House, did this other uh, study with similar ca uh, categories but with sounds. So these are sequences of sounds, kind of similar to what the birds were learning, and depending on uh, the, some, of, some of these will be uh, the diagnostic for the category, so they will have a value for category A and a different value for category B, and some others will be present in both. So what we do uh, to assess the effect of category learning is to see how uh, two things changed after having learned a category. We do similarity perception. This is by subjective judgments. We m monitor before and after learning the category. And we see that things in different categories are rated as more different after and as more similar uh, or all this, almost the same before if they're in the same category. So same category don't change much, but things that are in different categories are rated as more different, so separation. And these are subjects that didn't learn that don't show um, this same effect. We also do it with objective judgments, same different judgments, and we see that discrimination improves after learning the category. So they are better at the discrimination task once they have learned, and they maintain uh, the, the same discrimination rate for things that are in the same category. So all of this to show a little bit of uh, the effects of learning a category in perception. And then, well, the importance of learned categories. Category learning and the, the, the 
um, subsequent categorical perception, learned categorical perception, is important for language acquisition and musical training. Learning to, dis uh, to categorize will help us discriminate better between sounds, and this is important in language. But coming back to language, uh, for those of you that are um, sim uh, familiar to the work of uh, Patricia Cole, she was the one that um, found that in infants during the se first year of life, they can discriminate between phonemes uh, almost universally before they learn their language. So that's a kind of the basis of speech production, being able to, learn, to tell apart a ba from a pa. Uh, so this is the peak in discrimination, which corresponds to separation. This is the voice onset time. So these are uh, regular changes, and whenever it crosses the boundary between the ba and a da, there's a huge peak in discrimination that allows us to tell two phonemes apart. And this ability to tell two phonemes apart will be what eventually allows us to imitate this sound production and be able to produce speech. So when Pat Culp uh, published this, she was uh, speaking about this perceptual magnet effect that's kind of what allows us to separate phonemes in our native language and eventually produce them, and was saying that this is not present in monkeys. So, as we have seen after Carol's presentation, there are many uh, cognitive traits in birds that underlie human speech, and something that has always amazed me about uh, parrots, for example, is their capacity to produce and to imitate speech. So, uh, the food for thought that I want to open for discussion and also ask Carol is how this uh, capacity to uh, extract features, either local or global features in birds? Is it related to the way they produce speech? And if so, what, is, um, what are birds lacking that, that doesn't allow them to like, produce speech like uh, sounds uh, uh, beyond imitation? So, thank you. up a general discussion with questions for both speakers at this stage. I think you guys might be fine chairing the discussion yourself, um, but let me know if you want me to take charge. Okay. So, there's already a question asked by the discussion. Yeah. Um, so, could you rephrase your question, uh, please? And Yes. Because there were a couple of items you addressed in your last slide, a couple of questions. So what, what would be your main? So my precise question is, we know that uh, birds have these cognitive traits that we um, know that underlie speech production in humans. And yeah. so related to categorize, the ability to categorize, to categorize sounds and to discriminate sounds, I know, we know that this is essential for kids to produce speech. So. <clears throat> My precise question is how um, the discrimination of phoneme sounds or categorical perception in birds, uh, is it, how is it related to the speech imitation? Or if there's anything that has been done to show if the speech imitation is the consequence of uh, sound categorization in birds? Yeah, well, from what's known about uh, sound perception in birds and sound categorization in birds, they are capable of making all sorts of discriminations between different sounds. And also uh, you can do, uh, as we have done, experiments on uh, how birds perceive speech sounds and how they can categorize speech sounds in, the, in the particular categories. How that's related to the sort of uh, production of speech is a different matter. So parrots are indeed capable of reproducing human speech. Uh, which is also part of a consequence of how their production system is being built, which is somewhat different from how that is in songbirds. There are some songbirds like minas who also imitate uh, human speech. So in terms of uh, perception of sound and of speech sound and of bird sounds, I think the capabilities of birds are quite similar to those of humans actually. Um, what uh, the problem is, is, to, is whether they can um, use those sounds to produce their own sounds later on. 
And uh, although many of the song, well, all songbird species and parrots have the ability for vocal learning, but there are degrees of learning in that. And usually species are quite sensitive or more sensitive to sounds within their conspecific range than to alien sounds. And also the social context in which these sounds are presented is highly important. So they will only imitate if it's uh, the sound from a parent or one with whom they have close social interactions rather than a random uh, thing. So I don't know whether that's an answer to your question otherwise. Yes, I, I think that answers uh, the question. So it would be similar to infants in the sense that regardless of uh, which language they're exposed to, they will be able to imitate based on the interaction with the parent or with the person yeah, from which yeah, they are. Yeah, uh, that's very important. Yeah, okay. yeah. But there are constraints in to what extent if you replace the parent by a parent of another species, so to speak, in a bird, then uh, there are constraints in how readily it will imitate that sound. And my last question then would be, so is phonemic imitation by birds universal? So can they produce any phoneme in any human language? If like no, they can't. Okay. There are definite limitations there, uh, although the flexibility is larger than uh, it's, it's often assumed. Uh, so there have been examples of bird species where initially the researchers found that they could only, uh, so in the traditional song learning paradigms, what they did is they take a young bird, expose it to a tape recorder of its own species, playing the song of its own species, or a recorder playing the song of another species. And then those uh, very first studies indicated that they will only learn the sound of their own species, not from the other species. And uh, they thought, so they thought there would be strong constraints on the learning abilities until they used live tutors. And if they had a live tutor of the same species of which the recording was being refused as a model, then they copied the live tutor, even though that song was quite deviant from the normal song of their own species. Mm -hmm. So they can, under certain circumstances, imitate quite a lot of r sounds outside the normal range. Okay, and just the last question before we open uh, for the rest of the uh, attendance. Um, what about the mockingbird? Like, uh, is, he any is he any different than other species of birds in terms of the range of sounds that he can imitate? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are large species differences. So mockingbirds and starlings and minas uh, and a range of other bird species, they do imitate other species and accept that as a model. And uh, yeah, there is quite a bit of literature on what they are doing and how they are doing that. But uh, yeah, might go into too much detail. Thank you. So uh, yeah, give you the floor first. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, in the graded scale of birds that discriminate rhythm or not, like um, when, they when they communicate with each other, let's say in the context of finding a mate, uh, how important is rhythm in the message? Like, is it more uh, important for large parrots and uh, less for pigeons, let's say? All right, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I didn't mention at all that uh, in the vocalizations of many species, you can detect a rhythm. And the pigeons are particularly interesting because when you listen to pigeons, they really have a very regular pattern in their cooing. It depends a bit on the species, but there are some species which have a very strict rhythmic pattern in their natural cooing. And that's common in a lot of behaviors of many animals. And that's also why Darwin thought, okay, well, I see all these rhythmic patterns in behavior and vocalization, so they must be sensitive to musical rhythms as well. Um, apparently, that's not the case. So even though they may show rhythms in their own vocalizations, that doesn't mean that they are able to detect arbitrary rhythms in arbitrary sounds. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, some of the questions I was going to ask have already been asked, but it seems to me, first of all, I'd like you to tell me how this is cognition. Secondly, I think it's perfectly reasonable to look at differences amongst birds, and I'd like to know about the relatedness of these individuals as well, because clearly that's a huge group of animals. But it's, 
also based on, you're setting up a straw man, really, saying, are these animals like us? Isn't it more reasonable to say, how are they like each other, and what is the basic cognitive ability that you think is coming from the sensation about how to detect rhythm? But that's, that's a huge question. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is a huge question. It's more than one question, actually. So first, is this cognition? Well, if uh, the sort of general co definition of cognition, if that has to do with processing, complex processing, uh, concept formation, and things like that, that's the problem I'm studying. So I would say, yes, it's definitely cognition. Um, why do I use humans as a model? Uh, that's not a part of your question. And uh, compare birds or whatever species to humans. Well, I, I mean, my origin uh, as a researcher is really in trying to understand the natural communication in animals. So I studied birdsong and birdsong communication for many years. And when you do that, I mean, you can't help at some stage encountering the question, well, we see vocal learning in songbirds and other species. We see that they have a structure in the vocalizations. We see that there is quite a bit of complex processing going on. And uh, we also have this other species, humans, who show complex vocalizations. But when you look at our relatives for humans, and you go to the great apes, their vocalizations are completely different. There is no learning going on at all. So the question is, to what extent are there similar abilities in birds uh, as there are in our species? And can what we can observe in birds and detect in birds, can that give any cues as to what might have been at the basis of the evolution of our abilities to produce language and everything which is connected to that. So that's why I ended up doing this, I agree, highly artificial experiments for these species, but which at the same time reveal that they have cognitive abilities, which might have been at the basis of our more advanced abilities as well. Uh, th thanks very much for the talk. I, I find it especially exciting, not just intrinsically, but because it's, it's related also to what we're doing with people. Um, I, and so I have a few questions. The, the first, the easiest one is, do you think that your findings are, uh, are related to um, syntax or prosody or both? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So yesterday I wasn't here, unfortunately, because I was at a workshop on prosody. Uh, so I think that there is, uh, um, yeah, I'm, well, let me ask, why do you ask that question about, is it syntax or prosody? What do you have in mind with that? Well, I mean, syntax is a much more complicated issue, uh, and uh, elements of innateness arise uh, that, right. that don't arise in yeah. prosody, and yet they have the same, if you forget about language, I mean, a, a, a semantic language, they have uh, similar properties. They're, they're s rhythms and, and uh, yeah. patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, actually, that's one of the reasons why we also go into this rhythm area. It's, it's because of there are similarities there with prosodic patterns. And we also did a series of experiments in which we used speech sounds and examined whether uh, if you arrange these speech sound in particular prosodic patterns, as I know from speech, whether the birds are also able to detect these prosodic patterns. So our work is a bit at the interface of these different things and trying to look for what are the sort of primitive situations from which more complex abilities may arise. Okay, my, my second of third questions is a, is a hybrid question. Um, you know that in, in per pitch perception uh, in humans, there's a distinction between relative pitch and absolute pitch. Yeah. I'm suggesting maybe that what you call global rhythm may be more absolute rhythm rather than relative rhythm. It, it's, it's analogous to, to the pitch story there. Yeah. 
And yeah. the difference and the relative, the, the differences may also be similar, uh, uh, <laughs> the differences. The distinction between relative pitch and absolute pitch may have similar functional consequences for rhythm, and they, that should be looked at directly. So yeah. that's sort of a question comment. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that, that's a very interesting uh, point. Um, um, I guess what I call local cues to which they are sensitive has to do with uh, indeed detecting very specific intervals and being sensitive to that. And yeah, I mean there is a certainly, certainly an analog analogy there uh, between uh, absolute perception, uh, pitch perception and this sort of uh, uh, absolute rhythm perception. And my last one concerns uh, the underlying theme, which is the production and, pr and perception and production systems. That those uh, capacities, cognitive and motor capacities, that have both a perception and a cognitive side. You looked at these species because they uh, have vocal production capacities, but of course the parrots were not using vocal. When the parrots who were uh, who were uh, in training to the rhythm were using yeah. movement, and that's yeah. my last question. Uh, what about in general uh, species with the capacity to mimic or imitate movement patterns, and how that's related to these vocal imitation patterns? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's also a very interesting question because um, one of the reasons why rhythm or dancing songbirds might not have been found is that they are motorically might be less capable of demonstrating that than parrots are because parrots they have had bobbing displays in many species uh, in their natural behavior so what what these experiments uh, or these what, what what snowball is showing is actually uh, our natural behaviors but they are synchronized with this music. And that might have been brought about by a long period of domestication and training of this particular bird. It's not something it does spontaneously, but there has been a long history in this bird, a uh, developmental story behind it. You mean this individual, uh, Snowball? In, the, in that individual, oh. in Snowball. But it wasn't so rare. We've seen it in, in other big parrots. Well, it can be seen, but to really synchronize, but, but as I say, I mean, the, the, these displays are quite common in parrots, and that's why it might have been observed in other parrot species as well, and not in songbirds, because they have very few displays in which they might show behaviors which can be readily synchronized with, uh, with music. And that's also why we focused on the perceptual side, asking the question, maybe they have the perceptual ability to detect it, even though they might not be able to demonstrate it in their own behaviors. But prosody and, okay, yeah. I think we should okay. limit ourselves to one, yeah. one question per question. Hi, thank you for the talk. I have, uh, my first quest question is pretty uh, simple. It's about your method. Uh, all right, then I'll, I'll go for the other one. Um, have you uh, measured the, the exposure to uh, music in some experiment, how it could change the, the, the behavior toward rhythm? Because even among humans, there's a lot of variation um, for the response and the imitation of, of rhythm, I find. And I, I kind of think it's a product of culture and expo exposition. Yeah, no, we haven't been uh, playing around with that. Um, my expectations is that it won't make any difference. So the music as such has no meaning to the birds, is my guess. And it won't help to to play the, what is it, the Backstreet Boys? Uh, yeah, but the, expo the exposure to, to various kind of rhythm, I mean, how could that yeah. affect? Yeah, it might. I might. It might if we played more of these simple patterns in their natural environment or the, 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 the laboratory environment, I should say, hmm. whether that might make them more prone to learn that. Maybe, maybe. Interesting idea. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I think my question can be like answered by both of you because it's maybe like a trivial question about categorizations and like processes or something, but I was wondering, um, about the fact that we know in, in musician and non-musician that we are like also less accurate with like slower stimuli. Like if I would, yeah, you know what I mean. 
And I was wondering, like, maybe we are just like losing some category, categorical <laughs> traits. Uh, I mean, do we need like? Um, uh, I will formulate it another way. Um, we are better to discriminate categories categories if there is more cues. No, no. So if there is like uh, um, more like um, rules that are applying to stimuli, then we are going to be better. Like uh, so, I'm thinking about Gestalt principles and laws. So if we lose, for example, like when it gets, it's getting slower and slower, we're losing the like, proximity rule. So even like if, if it's getting faster, we're having a proximity and similarity and other rules that are applying to the stimuli. So of course we are getting better at it. So maybe like their graduate like skill would be like a graduate gestalt categorization yeah, principles yeah. or something like that in cognition. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, two answers to that. Uh, the first one is that um, we, um, we actually were also interested in gestalt-like phenomena in another experiment in which we looked at uh, the abilities to detect uh, uh, yambi, yambic and trochaic patterns in strings of sound. So if uh, a grandfather clock says tick tock, tick tock, and we perceive it as tick tock and not as tock tick, so we group them perceptually, and we have been doing some experiments where the zebra finch are, are doing the same thing. Apparently, yes, they are doing the same thing. Okay, that's uh, one answer. The other is uh, in relation to slower being more difficult to detect. Well, the, the reason why the stimuli we used sound quite artificial to us is that because their temporal structure is much faster than we would use if we would have to detect a regular rhythm. But we took care that we were within the range in which song elements are being produced. So they are, we are using intervals between elements uh, which might be found in natural songs and in the natural vocalizations. So we try to be with all our stimuli within the, the same category as you like, uh, which we expect to be there. But you're right that some things might be more well, difficult. It would just be more like proximal than, you know, more local yeah, yeah, features yeah. Than, than global features. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, the answer to my initial question was, uh, came out in your answer to that one. Um, so I'll ask a different one. Um, with regard to the uh, analogical uh, reasoning studies, um, it seems to me that the uh, last study you presented is somehow importantly different from all the other ones with your analogical reasoning um, because there's no transfer of um, features. Uh, in all, it looked, at least from the video that, that you presented, like the um, stimuli are presented um, contemporaneously, so the, the sample and the match and, and the items to be matched are presented at the same time. Is that, is that true? Sorry, which which in the analogical reasoning study with the yeah. studies, the the birds are looking at the um, at the sample and then the two other yeah, stimuli yeah, at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so one um, seemingly uh, obvious uh, objection somebody might want to level as well. What they're doing is they're just perceptually grouping these features. Something they're 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 you know there's some kind of recognition of of certain features. Um, but then this last, the, the last study uh, seems to rule out that objection. Um, and I just was wondering um, what the, if there was a difference in the success rate in the birds between that condition and the others. Um, if, if that one was substantially harder for some of the birds, or, or what, in other words, what, what, what are the individual differences on that, on that task? Sorry about that. Um, well, there are certainly differences in the outcome between the different experiments and what they might tell. And one of the points in my summarizing slide is that what the birds do of any species in one particular task and in one particular context might not be representative of what they might do in another one, mm -hmm. which to us might seem uh, to require the same sort of abstraction or conceptual thinking as the first task. So is that something of an answer? Yeah. Otherwise we can discuss later on. I, I think 